gear this week, braving the elements on the muddiest climbs in the southwest of England? Is there a case for a device to restrict the maximum speed of cars? When we look at Fiat's new contender for the family-sized saloon market. Hello and welcome to this week's Top Gear. We're in Turin for the motor show, or to be more precise, we're on the roof of the huge old Fiat factory in Lingotto. So big they built a test track here, and this is where all the production cars got their first spin as they came off the line. When Fiat moved out of here, it became the home of the motor show. Now at the heart of the Turin show, of course, is styling. Engineers and stylists come from all over the world to catch a glimpse of the curves of luscious concept cars like this one from Gijaro. So let's start this evening with a look at what the stylists have to offer for 1990. These concept cars are essentially thoughts of the future. Indeed, they're often extreme flights of the designer's fancy. They do incorporate many ideas that are built into future models. Pininfarina is a name that rings around the world, partly because their designs have been used by so many companies, from General Motors in the States to Rolls-Royce in the UK and just about everybody else in between, but mainly because of their long, long association with Ferrari. So it's fitting they should celebrate their 60th birthday with a concept car based on the Ferrari Testarossa. It's called the Mythos, uses the same flat 12 engine and mechanicals, but there really the similarity ends. They've chopped seven inches off the back end and made it five inches wider, so it's much more of a, a delta shape. It's 560 pounds lighter because they've used costly carbon fibers. The styling altogether more brutal and more aggressive. Comes without windows, without a soft or hard top, just this vestigial windscreen, so very much a racing car feel. You've got minimal instrumentation, basic door panels. The $64,000 question, of course, is will the Mythos influence future Ferrari designs or are we looking at a marvellous piece of automotive sculpture that will eventually find its way into the Pininfarina Museum? Much more down-to-earth is Pininfarina's research car called the CNR, the resultant attempt to design a practical car with the most aerodynamic body ever produced. It's a full four-seater with a coefficient of drag of 0.19 well below the current crop of production cars. It certainly looks quite conventional. It can't really be said for Michelotti's study for tomorrow's town car. Built on Fiat Uno mechanics, it's called the Ville de Mille, French techno speak for a year 2000 city. Seat five within its orange egg-like body. Bertone is one of the most powerful of Italian design studios, best known perhaps for a long string of stunning mid-engine sports cars, such as the Lamborghinis, Miura and Countach, and the Lancia Stratos, the name but three. Their current offering is bang in the middle of that tradition. It's called the Nivola, after one of the most famous of Italian racing drivers, Nuvolari. It's got a huge 5.7 litre, 32 valve Corvette engine placed just behind the driver's spine. Under the engine cover, there's a tray to take the roof panel that detaches. The engine is well forward, and a real sign of the times is the space occupied by the big catalytic converters. So the only space for luggage is in the very wide doors. To say the least, an unusual solution. It certainly isn't the car to take to your local supermarket. But it does claim a 0 to 60 time fractionally faster than the Ferrari F40, 4.3 seconds. And Bertoni claim it's close to production. Ital design in the person of Gigiaro is a mere youngster on the Italian design scene. They've only been going 22 years. In that time, they've racked up a fearsome track record over 80 designs including such front runners as the Golf, the Uno, and the Lancia Delta. The Aztec, which we saw earlier on the roof, was first revealed over two years ago. It's back on the stand because they've just gone into a, a short production run in Japan. But that uh, ice blue sinewy shape over there is perhaps a hint of the future. The famous mark of Bugatti is about to be reborn. And that's Ital's offering based upon the very tough, very compact specification that Bugatti have issued. Tucked away at the end of the hall is one of Europe's biggest design studios, not from Turin or Milan, but from Worthing. IAD are out to beat the Italians at their own game, and they've got two models on display. This black and yellow wasp of a sports car is called the Venus. The Sting is a 2.2-litre Lotus engine mounted amidships. A 
vehicle to turn the head and tickle the fancy perhaps, but not so significant as their MPV or multi-purpose vehicle. It's a sort of mixed leisure and pleasure vehicle, plenty of room for family, a certain amount of cross-country ability, but not too much, and very much part of a trend, of course. Fiat have one planned, even Mercedes have one on the stocks. This one's based on the Escort chassis. You can get six people in there with ease, a nice light spacey feel with all this glass, and have they got the answer here to Europe's problems of mixed left-hand, right-hand driving drive from the centre? Now, with the exception of this vehicle, there's a common factor linking most of the cars in this hall, namely power, power and speed. Most of them can do well over 150 miles now, although, of course, there are very few places now in the Western world where they can drive at anything like that speed legally. Even Germany will, in a couple of years, have to come into line with the rest of Europe. And, of course, it's now power that sells cars right across the market range. But with our roads becoming more congested, with more and more powerful engines sitting boiling in traffic jams, is there a case for the unthinkable, for some kind of mechanical limiting of a vehicle's top speed. Obviously very controversial, but Tom Boswell has been looking into the pros and cons. It may seem surprising, but the 70 mile an hour limit was only introduced permanently 23 years ago, following a three year experimental period. Today, motorway cruising at well above that legal maximum seems to be accepted by motorists, and even tacitly approved of by some police forces, depending of course on the prevailing conditions. In the United States, there's some evidence that a lower motorway speed limit results in fewer accidents. Over the last three years, most states have raised their maximum limit from 55 to 65. The death rate on these roads is now up by a third, to 2,800 killed per year. So couldn't a simple gadget be fitted to all vehicles to limit their speed to, say, 10% above their legal maximum? Now, whilst it may be fiercely contested if applied to cars, coach operators have had to fit such devices to their new vehicles since last April. And for older coaches, speed limiters will be phased in over the next year. These laws followed a series of accidents involving coaches on high-speed roads. Thirteen people were killed in this horrific crash on the M6 five years ago. The French have had to fit limiters to bigger trucks for 10 years now, and current discussions mean that lorry anti-speed devices could soon become a requirement throughout the European community. In the UK, limiters are now fitted voluntarily to about 1 in 10 heavy goods vehicles. Increasingly, fleets, like the post office, Sainsbury's and Esso, have introduced devices to fix a desired maximum speed. Setting the speed hold at 60 miles an hour, this means that at no time can I now exceed 60. It gives me full concentration to the road and everything around me. The vehicle is also fitted with a top speed limiter of 70 miles an hour. So the vehicle cannot exceed that speed. As we approach 60 miles an hour, the feeling is just as the accelerator is being magnetically pulled away from your foot. I can already hear you saying, it's all right for those menacing lorries, but not for cars. But why not? The equipment manufacturers say they could be fitted fairly easily, and it wouldn't be a complicated job. These are the two major components for fitment to a truck. Um, an actuator, which is controlled by an electronic module. If we were to transfer this technology to a car, then depending on the fueling system fitted, would depend on whether you would use both these units or if it was a fuel injection system, you would only use the actuator and modify the electronics in the vehicle so as to remove the need for this. That obviously has a substantial effect in costings. A combined system, you're looking at around 150 pounds fitted to the vehicle, whilst if it's a modification of the software, then the only unit you're fitting is this, bringing the price down to substantially less than 100 pounds. The motoring organisations are reluctant to give limiters an unqualified acceptance. Even at around £100 a vehicle, they feel the total cost would be better spent on other car safety measures. Our first reaction would be to look at the cost-benefit ratio. Uh, on the one hand, you'd have the cost, which uh, over a period of years would be something like between £1,000 million and £2,000 million to motorists. And you'd have to look at that and say, now, could that money be better spent to save lives in better ways? There's no logical uh, argument against some form of limitation. Um, but you've got to have the ability to, uh, to accelerate out of trouble. And I think being realistic, 
you will have the ability to travel at between 80 and 85 on roads when the conditions permit. Whether anti-speeding devices are set at or above the legal maximum, what about the problem of mechanical failure? Well, the manufacturers claim that warranty returns are less than one in a thousand. On lorries, a sealed unit helps prevent tampering. And if introduced onto cars, checking the system could become part of the MOT test. The Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders, who speak for the car makers, have no firm view on the subject. But manufacturers of performance cars are worried. I can't help feeling that there must be better ways of detecting the very small minority of people who are going to break the law rather than putting a, a blanket uh, a mechanism on, on all cars. Most independent-minded people would regard it as a considerable infringement of their own liberty to have a device like this thrust upon them when it's an area where most mature people can use responsible judgment. The introduction of speed limiters on cars is technically feasible and they could be a relatively cheap and very effective method of controlling the speed of cars of the future. The police would need special enforcement powers and maybe the MOT test would have to include checks on the equipment. These devices would certainly be fiercely debated and obviously there would have to be extensive testing before they were made compulsory. But it is surprising that so far as we're aware, no pressure group, political party or individual politician has ever campaigned for their introduction. Well, as I say, that's a controversial issue. If you've got strong views about it, why not write to us at our usual address, Top Gear, BBC Pebble Mill, Birmingham, B5, 7QQ. Now, Turin is often called the Fiat show because they and their associated companies dominate the market in Italy and also because they always take such a huge stand here. Now, this year, much of that stand is occupied by the Tempra, including this estate or station wagon version on which apparently they pulled out all the stops to get ready on time. It's not just a replacement for the rather disappointing regatta weekend, it's also the first salvo in Fiat's declared battle plan to launch 17 new models in the next 10 years to snatch the lead in the European market from their arch rivals Volkswagen. Chris Goff has been driving the saloon version. Fiat's new Tempra represents a bold attempt by the company to move what is essentially a teapot-sized car with a boot into the upper-medium sector, where it will be up against cars like the Sierra and Cavalier in the UK. Now, looking at the car, you might have thought it was more of a competitor for other booted versions of smaller hatchbacks like Ford's Orion and Volkswagen's Jetta. But Fiat maintain that moving up a class is justified by the quality and refinement they've built into it. Fiat uh, say they've gone to great lengths to try and eliminate any shakes or rattles in the inside of the Tempra. It comes with two levels of trim. This is the SX version, and with it you get a rather garish electronic digital dashboard. Personally, I prefer the simple analogue instruments of the base version. But you do get uh, quite a sophisticated heating and ventilation system with optional automatic electronic temperature control. It's nicely trimmed inside. You get a, a folding armrest that's very comfortable, except you can't get the handbrake on very easily when it's down. But apart from that, plenty of elbow room, lots of leg room, and plenty of head room too. Certainly competes well with the Cavalier Sierra class. The boot lid opens quite wide, but the lock looks rather hazardous to an unguarded forehead. Plenty of space in the boot for three suitcases. We put a couple of bags in as well, but you'd have to unload everything to get at the spare wheel, which lives under the boot floor. Power steering is only an option on this 1.6 litre version. I think it's almost essential. Power steering itself is a very nice system. It's uh, nicely weighted, it's not too heavy, it gives you a very good feel of the road and it also enables you to place the car very precisely 
and to exploit the excellent road holding. It's something that presumably you would buy this Fiat for over a Sierra or a Cavalier. It's uh, well balanced, it doesn't understeer or oversteer and if you had to escape from an emergency situation at speed, the car would stay very much on your side. It's fun to drive but ultimately very safe. You can get into quite a comfortable driving position in the Tempra. The seats are supportive around the bends and uh, the steering wheel is at the right angle for me. You can adjust it up and down. Italians have concentrated all the minor controls on two stalks on either side of the wheel. Once you get used to it, it's a very convenient way of grouping them. There are 1.4, 1.6 and 1.8 injection engines available. This is the 1.6. Not quite nice mid-range punch, but it's uh, hardly the Italian brio that we used to get with their old twin cam engines a few years ago, where you just uh, let it scream its head off to get the ultimate in performance and hang uh, low down torque and flexibility. You can see why the Italians have done it, of course. They've got to appeal to a, a much bigger European market, but in doing that, you sometimes think they may have lost a little bit of their flair and character. So does Fiat's experiment to move Tempra upmarket succeed? Certainly it's quiet, refined and quite enjoyable, but it's against stiff opposition in a fiercely competitive market sector. It certainly won't be an easy task to make it a winner. The car will be launched in Britain this summer and we'll know Fiat's pricing structure then. So to sum up, the Tempra scores well on its refinement and handling, it's got very good aerodynamics and all external panels are made from galvanised steel. On the minor side there's that digital dashboard and only average performance. There was a slight gearbox whine too on our test car and although I like armrests, I do like to be able to put on the handbrake. Now back home to one of the oldest events in motorsport, the Land's End Trial. All kinds of vehicles take part except those with four-wheel drive and Tony Mason was in at the start of this year's event. First run in 1908 as a motorcycle reliability trial from London to Land's End and back, this classic event is unique and it's still going strong. The motorcycling club who organised it first admitted cars in 1914, but otherwise little has changed over the years. There's always a full entry of 350, making it one of the biggest events in motorsport, but it's not particularly well known. It's strictly for amateurs, no sponsors, no works teams and no prize money. Are you all right up there? Yes, thank you. It's a bit cold to be so high out. Yes. You feel like getting down by ten layers on. <laughs> And Mrs Vaughan will need all those ten layers of clothing. The forecast is frost tonight and rain tomorrow. Once the bikes are on their way, the cars are scrutineered. It's more of a mini MOT, really, as the cars have to be road legal with everything working. Spare wheels and batteries must be strapped down tightly, but do many cars fail to make it through scrutineering? One or two we send round again, then we send them off to put something right, like that uh, buckler just now that had to have a, a petrol leak rectified. We don't like to fight them because, they, you know, we're all, we're all competitors together and we all want to, we all want to have a run, you know. It's a very long way in an old car, but um, the hills, it's, just, it's not the hills that are different, it's a bit in between them. <laughs> Nothing falls off usually, sometimes the engine breaks, otherwise it seems to get there usually. But we manage, we manage. This looks like the big family outing, is it? Well, it is this time. All we've got now, we haven't got the dogs here, that's all. So, so, I mean, you, this you is the first time. You've to stay on board all the way around. Well, we hadn't got a car to do it in East so we went down to the local car office. We were determined to do it. £130. You paid £130 for this? That's right. And you just got to do the event of it? And if we don't get back, we should go back on a yellow lorry. Let's hope they make it. But I doubt whether the Bradshaw's Chrysler estate will ever become a coveted classics trials car such as the Nutcracker team of three MGTDs reminiscent of the famous Cream Cracker team of the 30s. And this MGTA is one of those rare team cars. They were team cars produced by the old MG car company. 
and um, very famous. Only a few left now. So I'm very privileged to have one and very lucky to use it. So you've got to be very careful with it, though. No. <laughs> there are 14 difficult sections and a 350-mile journey deep into Cornwall ahead of the drivers, riders and this pair of well-attired gentlemen. The contestants may have changed slightly over the years, but many of the cars look just as they must have done several decades ago. By midnight, the competitors from Bristol, Basingstoke and Oakhampton were all converging on the Jolly Diner Cafe at Tintin Hill in Somerset. There, people and vehicles could be fed and watered before the real action began. How was the family outing? Very cold because there are some fumes coming up from the engine, so we have to have all the windows open, otherwise we die. Yours is the Ford Popular. The Ford Pop, yes. Yeah. How many events have you done in that? Oh, I bought it 26, 26 years ago anyway for 15 quid. It's a temporary piece of transport and uh, it's still going. We've been, we started trying it within three months of buying it and it's still going. As Angus trundled off into the night in his trusty Ford Pop on the way to another finish, the enthusiastic Bradshaw Brigade were hot on his heels. Unfortunately, their rear suspension broke early on. They went home to Northampton, got the family Sierra out and all returned to watch. That's the spirit in trialling. Meanwhile, somewhere in the wilds of Somerset... We've lost the route, basically, I'm afraid. Uh, we've had trouble with the other car and uh, they've got no light, so we were sort of... We've been going fairly slowly with um, finding the way, and, mm. and he hasn't been checking the route either. We've missed the turning. Is there any danger of losing a lot of time or anything? Um, probably. Yes, there would be no. I'm afraid yeah, we, yeah. we probably are. Mm. So. While some are still groping around in the dark, others have already arrived at Beggar's Roost near Lynmouth in Devon. The Roost is one of the most notorious hills. It stopped the traffic in 1908, and it's still stopping it today. I've heard the first three sections have been relatively easy and uh, cleanable. Yes, they have. They've been uh, very dry, very, lots of grip. Is that normal for the Land's End trial? Um, it varies from year to year, but uh, this year it's been good. And what do you think about the one that's coming up, this famous Beggar's Roost? Always a problem. <laughs> for John Boswell and his co-pilot, Carol Woodham, Beggar's Roost posed no problem and their Dutton held on to its clean sheets. The early birds, however, have the advantage in many ways as the hills get more and more churned up as the day goes on. Despite extra weight over the driving wheels, front-wheel drive cars like the Citroen are always at a disadvantage on the steeper hills. Well, that's how we so in the middle of the night you were completely lost, wasn't yes. it? Yes, we made it. And there are our other chaps just behind us too. He's, he's still, we're still battling away, you know. Okay, sir. Here you go. To a little local encouragement, the cars went up and out of Beggar's Roost. They then moved on to complete, or fail, another four tests before attempting a section with a difference. After slithering and sliding up nine hills, Hobbs' choice in North Devon was a downhill test. It's very short, about 80 yards between one line of scouring powder and the next. And still cleaning up, John and Carol in the Dutton. Hobbs' choice is a special test, which is done for a tiger sizer on times, which in actual fact is downhill. <laughs> um, but there's a, a very sharp left-hand bend, uh, which people get wrong and then steer off. Uh, we only went a little bit up, I think. For 40 years, Morris Miners have been competing here, and this year is no exception. But John Turner's was the only one in evidence. Hobbs' choice is time to the second, and it's used to determine positions in the classes when a number of competitors have cleaned all the hills. This is added to another time section, the evil Crackington Hill, the first test in Cornwall. It's a long, fast blind in deep, glutinous mud, made even more delightful by the addition of farmyard effluent. It calls for a certain amount of aggression and particularly sensitive throttle control by the riders and drivers, which is what trialling is all about. 
To make it even harder for the specialist trials cars, the organizers kindly arrange for them to stop astride a line and start again. Some do, some don't. In fact, quite a few don't. Fail to start or roll backwards even an inch and you've had it. You've failed the section. You're ungraciously assisted to the top and it's goodbye to your gold. But still in the running for gold, our intrepid duo in the Dutton. Cracking in actual fact is my favourite section. Um, it's a good blast, which I thoroughly enjoy. And uh, when you get to the restart, um, it's uh, full of farmyard slurry, uh, which is quite difficult to get through. Um, but we managed to clean it. Also, a good passenger uh, and a bouncer is the kick because they get you up there. If you think bouncing up and down is easy, look at these two in the imp raising steam in the Crackington Mire. A gallant effort. Bit of a failure though. <laughs> but never mind. I did try. We tried hard. Conditions got worse as we made our way to Blue Hills, the last and some say the toughest section of them all. This is where strong men weep. You can clear all the previous sections and then fail miserably on the rocky tracks at the tin mine. It's steep and it's slippy, but if you're rear-engined and rear-wheel driven, you're in with a chance. If you're front-wheel driven... Oh dear. But what the heck, it's all part of the fun, although if this grand old Austin 10 had known what it was in for, it would probably have stayed at home in the dry. What sort of a trip has it been? Wet. <laughs> <laughs> wet and Very cold. Wet. You feel tired? Actually, no. I think probably in an hour or so. Yeah. Got our second one about 10 o'clock this morning, I think. So how have you gone on overall anyway? Do you think? Well, we're clean so far. Which is more than could be said for the weather. It was filthy and the sections became wet and greasy. Blue Hills is very much the sting in the tail. The Dutton clawed its way up the first Blue Hill section and went on happily to clean the second and collect a first-class award and a coveted Land's End gold. By now, the Land's End trial was running late. The bikes had had few problems, but some of the cars had been on the road for 20 hours or more. A hard day's night. Well, it's a really wet and bedraggled convoy that have made their way here to the final section here at the Blue Hills Tin Mines near Newquay. It's been a day of bumping and boring, of broken drive shafts and burning rubber, and towards the end the weather conditions became atrocious. I'm freezing, but I'm told by the organisers that this hasn't been a tough Land's End trial. I wouldn't like to see one that is. Well, despite the rain, that looks as if it could be a great deal of fun. If you think you'd like to have a go, by the way, it's organised by the Motorcycle Club. And before we leave Turin, let's look very briefly at one of the new cars launched here that could cause quite a buzz in the UK, this gutsy-looking Fiesta RS Turbo. It's not all cosmetic. Basically, what they've done is to repackage the 1.6-litre engine out of the Escort RS into the Fiesta frame, give it a new turbo to improve the torque curve. The result is a sparkling performance said to be marginally quicker than the XR2i itself. Inside, all the requisite uh, Boy Racer package, Recaro seats, leather covered three spoke wheel and so on. Price unrevealed, thought to be between 12 and 13,000 pounds when it comes out in June. Now our apologies for not slotting in the Corvette item, we'll do that later in the series we hope. And you may have heard us last week lamenting the increasing use of road over rail for transporting cars. We're glad to hear that some companies are still using rail, good for them. Next week we're back in the UK, we got the winner of the Radio Times Rally Quest competition, we road test two new Toyotas, the MR2 and the Sleeker GT4. See you then. Until then, drive safely. Goodbye.